owners of, of Aventus or saw it some other way, there are, I guess, a very large number of workshops, over 200 different ones that pivoted very quickly into delivering these virtual options. So what you were able to get beforehand, most of it, I'm not saying all, but a large number of those courses are now available in this virtual method. So we put on some of these webinars to give you a taster, to let you know it's not just me talking over PowerPoint. You know, you would see the trainer live in this way, and that way we can still try to keep some virtual interaction going on. That's our aim here. So with this topic, it can be a challenging one. So just quickly about myself, you've probably worked out it's a British accent, but I've been in Singapore for over 10 years now. So it is home in many ways. Before that, I was in Australia. So some people sometimes think I've got an Australian accent, but if you live there for a short amount of time, you pick up this accent where you raise your voice at the end of a sentence for no reason. But now, now Singapore has been home and Singapore is home in the corporate world. And I guess as a professional trainer and speaker <clears throat> and why this virtual presentation world and facilitation is quite interesting is because people in my industry, we've had to change. And similar to what many of you have done, you've suddenly had to work from home. You might have done it like one day a week or depending on what your arrangement was. You've done it before, you've accessed your systems, but what we've realized is now we're in a slightly different world where we've been working from home for two months in some cases. And therefore, how does that actually work? How do we keep engagement? How do we run meetings? In my space, how do we do things like this? I'm now doing this from my office at, at home. But then I'm used to being in person, in front of you in a workshop. So therefore, we've all had to change in different ways. And hopefully what we can do in this short time this morning is just give you some, I guess, areas that you need to consider and focus. If you're going into this virtual world, maybe you're in sales and you're very confident going into a client's off office, delivering your pitch, but then how do we do that virtually? How do we sell over looking into a webcam, for example? How do we still deliver with confidence? How do we pitch to management? Is it the same nerves? Is it the same style? We don't have a whiteboard or a flip chart, but we can do. So we'll try to give you, I guess, some ideas of what we're gonna be going into more detail in the workshop, but also some stuff that you can take away and maybe look into further. I'm always available for questions if people do have them. <clears throat> so we're gonna start with a quick poll or a survey. Now, if you could take out your phones or open up a browser, go to menti.com. Most of us have been on webinars the last two months. A lot of people use menti, so you might be familiar with it. If not, just type in menti.com. You'll be asked for this six digit code, 364350. I'm gonna to have to open up menti soon. So I'm just gonna type this code into the chat box. So it's always there if we need it, <clears throat> menti.com. And I'm just going to switch my sharing over to that page so we can see when results start to come in. I didn't catch that. Could you try again? Oh, for some reason, Siri has opened up. Let's turn Siri off. I didn't get that. Could you try again? Okay, thank you, Siri. Okay. So we've got some of the answers coming in here. Let's have a look. We've got areas we could improve. We've got relevance, we've got engagement, yes. Keeping them interesting, that's a challenge, especially virtually. Effective sales, yes. Interactiveness, agreed. Being articulate, yes, it's not always easy. Okay, we'll just give another minute or two for these to come in. Okay, so we've got some great answers coming in there. <clears throat> Engagement is one of the largest ones. Keeping it relevant, yes, interesting. Now, <clears throat> why I like virtual presentation skills is a lot of us need help with presentation skills. And that's where 
we often start. I've been delivering presentation skills workshops for many years. So when you look at virtual presentation skills, sometimes we need to go back to the basics of how do we present better? And a lot of these things that we're saying here are relevant both <clears throat> virtually and in person. So therefore, we need to have a mix between getting the basics of presentation skills and then virtual is like a step up. It's like almost an advanced way of looking at presentation skills. So we can just, I'm just gonna switch back now to the PowerPoint, there we go. So let's have a, let's move on now. So why do most presentations fail? And yours might not fail, and if they don't fail, great. But many are not as successful as what they could be. So rather than failure, they often don't have the same success. Sometimes it's too wordy. I struggle with this. I'm English. We use three times as many words as we need to to explain things. Confidence is probably the biggest one that I hear. So you might be asked to make a presentation at work, but you hate giving presentations. And this is where I started when I was about 26. I was being asked to do more presentations to clients. I was in the finance world and I hated doing it. I'm more introverted. So the thought of having to stand up and be judged by senior bankers was probably the worst thing I could have actually had to deal with. So my boss sent me on a three day course and it took time, but if I had a structure, then my confidence increased. If I got feedback, every meeting would come back in the taxi and he'd start coaching me through what I could do more. The other one is PowerPoint. We're using PowerPoint. We don't need to use PowerPoint. I could explain this and just switch it off. So you've always got a choice whether you want to use PowerPoint or not. And again, virtually it makes a difference. We'll come back to that. You've got to have a problem that you're normally solving. Why are you, why are you presenting? You've got to be there for a reason. The audience needs to understand what that reason is. What do you want to achieve in that presentation? And then maybe a call to action. What do you want them to do next? Is it go and take notes? Is it come back in a week with some feedback? Is it to work on a presentation? So we want to have presentations for a reason, with clarity, a call to action if there is one. There normally is. Okay. So when we think about, if you're ever scared about public speaking, presentations, there's a term for it. So you can have a condition if you want to. Glossophobia, the fear of public speaking. So if you ever wondered what, what it was and whether it's a real thing, it is. The dramatic headline is a lot of surveys say people are more afraid of public speaking than death. It's a little bit dramatic, but I've seen many surveys say that type of thing. And of course, it sounds silly, but I see many people who are very technically good in their job then present very nervously and your impression can unfortunately drop a bit. I work with quite a lot of social scientists, so academics, and they have spent months doing a research assignment and they publish this fantastic <laughs> academic paper, but then they present that paper in conferences. They either try to put the whole paper onto PowerPoint and come up with like 140 slides for a 20 minute speech, or they get very nervous or their head down and all these things that don't quite work and they don't project the work that they've done. And they've done fantastic work, but the audience isn't seeing it. So we wanna make sure that if you're presenting, the quality of work you do in person, what you've been doing for years, is still represented in the way that you present. And as you get either more client focused or more senior, then your exposure to presentations gets higher. So it is a skill that we need to try to learn. And to do this, we need to try to connect with the audience. And I've got here in person because they are a little bit different. And I said, sometimes we have to start in person. So when you're in person, you wanna, if you're gonna use a PowerPoint deck, you wanna make sure that it's got a reason. I've worked with a lot of sales teams, like enterprise sales teams. And I still get a lot of people who, if they've got a projector slide behind them, which is normally here, then they turn around and they start to read off the, off the projector screen with the information. Now, it might sound very basic, but I see it still happen a lot. And it's often a confidence thing. It's like a crutch. I want to know that my information's here and I want to read it. But what happens? 
Today I've got a microphone so it can pick my voice up. But when you're presenting in person, you often don't have a microphone. So therefore, the moment you turn away from the audience, you're speaking into a projector screen. And that doesn't help anybody. So you want to make sure that the PowerPoint is supportive, as in the slides are supporting what your message is, but you're not using it to just read off things. <clears throat> now let's think about virtual presentations, which is the main topic of why we're here, really. Now, virtual presentations are different because obviously I'm used to presenting in front of a crowd. In the business world, I might be presenting maybe in front of eight or ten around a boardroom table. That's quite easy. I stand at the front, I have a TV or a projector screen here. That's nice. That's quite simple. And I start talking and hopefully I'm facing the audience. The basics around eye cameras and things. Uh, saw that message. Uh, let's just mute people. There we go there. So that's another thing. Let's just use that as a great example. You want to think about, are we going to mute people? Are we going to have people on camera or off camera? Now on camera increases engagement. So if this was the public workshop, I'd be asking for people on camera because we're talking about presentation skills. Therefore, we need to be set up. So if you're doing a presentation at home, which a lot of you will still be, therefore, how do we present? Where do you do it? I'm fortunate. I've got a spare room. Okay, that's one thing I'm fortunate about. I've got a room that I can use. I put my kids into the same room. I can use a room for an office. Many people don't have that luxury. So maybe a quiet corner of, of the living room. I've seen people make use of a hallway. It's you find what works for you given the circumstances. We're in unique times. Ideally, you have a quiet place, a place where you're not going to be disturbed by kids or pets or other household people. And then what are you going to have as your, as your backdrop? Now, I have a bookcase, and that's there for a reason. It's to create something called depth. But then what's behind me? Many people use green screens. Even you've got to think about clothes. I don't have any slides for clothes. But if I was to take off this jacket, OK, I'll take off this jacket. You can see my white shirt goes into a white wall. And it's not as good for contrast. But put a jacket, a sleeve, a scarf, or anything else on, and suddenly the whiteness isn't as much of an issue. Also, you may have seen people wear sort of colorful or checked shirts or something like that. It looks good in person. On camera, it has a, like a pixelated effect almost, and people get distracted by your shirt. So block colors work a lot better when presenting virtually. These are small things we never had to think about before, but suddenly it becomes relatively important. Now, backgrounds. Again, I don't think I have a slide on this, but let's just talk about backgrounds a while. A lot of people are using uh, virtual back backgrounds. Nothing wrong with that if you are a participant. But if you're presenting, you need to think about how do we make a virtual background work well. Now, I'm just going to put a virtual background on just to make my point here. <clears throat> and people have different opinions on, on this. I'll accept that. This is just my opinion. If I use a virtual background, I can have a virtual background here. And it's great. It's the same one. So you want to think about a different one. But then the moment I start to move my hand, I start to lose my hand. And therefore, in a professional presentation, I don't want my hand to be lost. I don't want my head to be lost if I'm starting to move. So do, this is without a green screen. Do I have a green screen? Yes, I've got two different types of green screens. I still very rarely use a virtual background when I'm presenting because I don't want the risk of my bandwidth dropping and suddenly this flickering comes back in and it just doesn't look as good professionally. It's fine if you're chatting with friends in meetings. I understand that if you want to put your branding behind you, great. But stand more still, because the moment you start to move around, you get this effect. And it's just something that I personally choose not to. The only times is when I want certain branding. But to be honest, there's other software like ManyCam and Ecamm and OBS that can create that type of branding without needing a virtual background. So I guess the message is if you're going to go virtual, definitely get a green screen and invest in that. 
but then test it out and think about, are you someone who moves around more? Do you have more um, sort of body mo movements and you use hands and gestures? If you are, you might want to think about how that looks and test it because you don't want to be in a sales presentation and you're flickering because they're going to get distracted with the flickering and not with what you're trying to say. And ultimately, we want them to focus on what we're trying to say. So there's a lot of different things. I'm going to go through some of the different aspects here. But first, let's get some of your opinions in. So into the chat box, nice and simple into the chat box. Can you write some of the bad things that you have experienced in webinars and virtual presentations over the last couple of months? You've probably been on many of them. Hopefully some were good. Some were probably not so great experiences. So for those that weren't quite as good, what was it that made them not quite so good? Can you write it into the chat box? What do you think needs to be improved amongst the general population? So I've talked about virtual backgrounds. Anything else? Okay, so on virtual background, yes, that can be. Some get it right, but you, it's normally a much higher, um, I guess, quality of computer and speed and everything. Reading chat box messages often. Yes, Heron, unfortunately, I'm reading your chat box message now. It's kind of ironic <laughs> in some ways, but yes, you can get distracted by it. Tend to lose focus. Yes, you, you do as a participant. I've been on many and it's like after 12 minutes, it can be annoying. Voice quality. Yes, unable to interact and connect. Very much so. Okay, Suji. Managing time. Yes, it's an important one. We're respectful of people's time in person. So why do we think because people are at home, we can go past time limits and things? We still need to respect people's times in the same way. It's just a different location. Visuals not clear is a very important part because we don't want things like contrast to be bad on PowerPoint slides. We don't want to see white writing on like light blue backgrounds. You might not be able to see these things. Um, okay, so SJ saying company insists on a virtual background, but you don't have a green screen. Yes, I fully understand that. And there's not too many things you can do quite often. I have one of those big oval type green screens and it folds up. I'll, I'll just get it quickly for, for you. It folds up into something like this, but then when you open it, it's like about six feet wide and it takes a, a YouTube tutorial or two to be able to put it back down again, but it does help. But again, I, is work going to pay for these things? Often not. Um, Dan Lin, group of nursing students use Menti, they were so quiet. Yes, that does happen. And it's always so difficult when no one uses their camera. So you spend the whole time presenting into a small, web, small webcam going, is anybody there? It's a difficult one. We've got 45 people on today. If I unmuted you all to get feedback, it would be chaos. So you have to mute you and find different ways. Is it chat box? Is it Menti? Is it a breakout room? We've got different ways, but really every 10 minutes or so, we need something coming in that they're doing something. Is it a raising hand? Is it an emotion? There's something that goes on. Last couple, a moderator is an interesting one because if I do a longer, a longer presentation, I have a moderator. Now, I'm fortunate that my wife is in my business, so that becomes a bit easier to have a moderator. But... I have someone who's dealing with, and we've got it, we've got it uh, to, to, uh, today, we've got people from Aventis on who are helping to admit you into the, into the room, so I don't need to admit people. I can focus on the presentation. So that really does help. So, that, so thank you for that. Let's stop that part now. So we all know the things that frustrate us. Some of it is the presenter's fault. Some of it is outside of it. If you've got to use a work virtual background, then <clears throat> you can't really say, no, unless you can prove that it's impacting the quality and things. Seeing people on camera, you can insist that people use a camera. I'm not going to insist for a free sort of uh, webinar in this way, but if we're in a workshop mode, then I get people to actually put their webcam on. 
One, it increases engagement. You can see the micro expressions, the faces. Two, if we're talking about presentation skills and don't have our webcam on, that's the first issue that we need to address because we do need to be set up for it. So when you're trying to connect, we looked at connecting in person, but so connecting virtually is the interesting bit. Now we often have shorter sessions. So a one day workshop is difficult to keep engagement, however good you are, for one day. So I break up one day workshops into two half, into two half days. We normally go 90 minutes maximum for a webinar, 60 minutes, or maybe a break, five minute break, halfway through, helps to keep people refreshed. They can stand up, they can walk around, they can grab a coffee, check some emails, whatever helps. Interactive activities, yes. So most of us use Zoom, but of course some companies don't use Zoom. They'll ask for WebEx, they'll ask for Teams. And there's varying degrees of interactiveness between all of those different applications. So you might need to get comfortable with it. But many people using Zoom. So what have we got on Zoom? We've got polls, we've got breakout rooms, um, we've got chat boxes. There's a few different ways how you can get interaction going in. So you need to build that in as much as you can. But of course, if you're making a business presentation for 20 minutes, don't suddenly go into a breakout room. Again, it doesn't make sense. You use the, the, I guess, the tools that you need to deliver the message of your presentation. My last point on this slide is more detailed explanations of activities. What does that mean? If I was going in person, that last slide giving instructions of what I, want, what I wanted here, I might have just spoken that and not put a slide up. But virtually, people are being distracted by a hundred different things, especially when they're working at home. So people miss instructions. It's not intentional. They might just miss the instruction. So therefore, you need to think about, well, if you want the audience to do something, we might need to be clearer. And sometimes the simplest putting it on a slide can help in that way. Now, if we were to move on. Let's talk briefly about lighting. So we talk about virtual presentations and things and, and the setup. The setup becomes one of the most important things. Lighting makes a difference if you're doing a professional presentation. I'm not saying you need to go out and buy studio lights, but can you position your desk nearer to a window? Can you get a desktop lamp that can help to illuminate your face if your room is a little bit dark? Where's the overhead lighting? Can you position your laptop closer to that? You've probably been on presentations where people are a bit dark. And again, it's not their fault because we're working from home, but you can do a little bit if you're making the presentation to think about your, your lighting. Now this is my job, so therefore I've got studio lighting. I don't mind sharing. I've got some softbox lighting, one on each side <clears throat> at the 10 to two position. So 10 to two positions, a 45 degree angle coming in. Don't light from behind you, light from in front or the sides. So it's not the most important thing, but even if you're at home thinking about even a good desktop lamp from, from Ikea for $15 can provide better lighting sometimes than the overhead lights. So it doesn't need to be expensive. It just needs to be tactical. So lighting is, is one thing. The next thing is the audio. Now people mentioned that you might get a bad connection, technical difficulties, all of these things. The Wi-Fi, we know we can get Wi-Fi boosters and things. So if you're gonna be working from home for a while and making presentations, we're right, we don't want it dropping out. Now you can always test it. You can use speed tests or you can use fast um, to try to look at your Wi-Fi speed. Wired internet is still the fastest way. Most of us use Wi-Fi. You go wired through an ethernet cable, you've got the greatest chance of getting the strongest um, internet connection possible. You want to think about <clears throat> how do we do sound? I'm using a USB mic. So this is a Blue Yeti mic. But again, we don't need this because it's not necessarily your job. But laptop microphones aren't the greatest. They're sufficient for a meeting, for a chat. But if we're presenting, or facilitating a session. Even 
a lapel mic, <clears throat> simple lapel mic like this, can clip on. This one costs about $20 from Boya, B-O-Y-A. They make pretty good, reasonably priced equi equipment. So we don't need the fancy mics, which you see some people have, unless you're going to be making a lot of them. But a $20 lapel mic can be two, three times better than your laptop microphone at, at times. And it can help to sort of knock out external noise and things. So to be honest, I think audio is probably the most important thing. The camera, it doesn't matter as much if I've got great clarity, but if I can't hear someone, then we're not really getting anywhere. So you really want to think about whether a simple upgrade to a lapel mic or a USB mic <clears throat> would actually help. Laptops are fine for just a chat and catching up with, with your team, a team meeting, something like that. We don't need to go overboard, <clears throat> but for professional ones, I would be looking for some upgrade on top of my laptop. If you do have questions at any point, just feel free to put them into the chat box. I am happy to answer them. If I think they're not relevant at this point, I'll just defer them to the end. The other one is body lang language. We talked about the virtual background, whether you move around a bit and we don't want that ghost effect that goes on. So what a lot of people do is they sit down and I still see this, I still attend webinars myself because I still want to learn during this period when it's quieter. And you see people sitting down and the presenter is leaning into the camera and you're seeing up, up their nose or you're seeing all types of things that you'd really rather not see. So <clears throat> your posture and where you sit and where you present becomes important. Now, if I wanted to use a real flip chart behind me or whiteboard, I'd need to step a little bit further back so I've got space. I'm choosing to stand for this particular presentation, but I could sit and we can, we can talk about that in the next slide or, or two. But I wanna be a decent away from the camera. I don't really wanna be leaning up so close that you can see everything. Because again, professionally, if we're presenting and making a sales presentation and on the other side, they're in the office, on a large screen, and all they see is your face really projected up on this large screen, they're gonna be distracted with that. So think about, do you want sort of upper torso limit up here? <clears throat> you might think, well, how do I get my camera there? Well, you've, again, you can be creative. I'm standing, which means my desktop <clears throat> is just below here. So my webcam is on top of my laptop. I've just got some storage boxes that are propping my laptop up to the right height. So again, think about your eyes. So for me, I like the webcam to be around chin level. That way I can look straight at the camera without being too, too, dis, too distracted. Now, if I was to show you what I mean by that, let me try and do this very quickly. We're just going to switch camera a little bit. So we can see that here, I've got a webcam on top that's quite high, and I've just got some boxes that are propping up my laptop. So it's at the same height. Now I'm just gonna switch that camera back again to my main one. So you can have multiple cameras and switch, switch between them, but again, most people don't need to do that. So I level, so I wanna be able to look into the, lap, into the camera. So the other thing, and you'll see every presenter sort of relax their standards on this, including me, is the number one thing you should try to do or try to remember, even though it's difficult, is to look into the camera and not look into people on your screen. So it's very difficult because we're used to making eye contact. If you make eye contact, if I put you on gallery view on my screen, I look at you now, I'm looking you all in the eye, not that many people are on, but if I'm, I'm looking down here, this is me looking at people on my screen. I'm not looking at you. If I go up to the camera, I'm looking at you. So that's the difference. You need to be able to remember to look into the webcam. A lot of us put sticky notes or post-it notes next to the camera to remind ourselves that this is where we need to be talking because talking to the screen is talking below people. So you're not making eye contact, which is what you're trying to do. It's a very strange thing to get comfortable with, but the key is, can you look into the camera, but still have your setup so you can see what you are presenting? So it does make a difference. Also, moving around an awful lot 
makes people feel a bit seasick and, and giddy. The easiest way is just plant yourself down. Uh, thank you, Dan, and yes, it really is the most important thing. I, put, I used to put a sticky note um, next to my camera and remind myself to look there. And then the reason why I have my laptop on top of my, ca my webcam on top of my laptop is so I can still glance down at what I'm presenting and the chat box and everything, but it's quite easy for me to look at you here. Another thing is you put your, cam you put your webcam onto a tripod if you've got the option and you can do that. One last thing about this setup that I hadn't put on. Um, do you need a webcam? Now, in Singapore, you can still order webcams. In England, they're hot supply. You can hardly get them. Um, now, I've got a MacBook Pro. That's not to sort of show off or go, oh, I'm a Mac person. Let me just show you what the, let me just move that. So you can see this is the MacBook Pro camera. This is the built-in one. Now, I think a MacBook Pro is a fantastic computer, but, and I thought this camera used to be fine, but you can see it's darker, more orange, it's not so clear. You get a decent webcam, and suddenly you can look so much clearer, like this. That's the difference between a laptop one and external one. So when people say, do I really need an external one? Well, it's not as important, but it does make a difference in clarity and vision, it will help with virtual backgrounds and everything else, okay? So that's just one thing. I, I have a Logitech 922, that works perfectly for, for me. My second one camera, which you saw just then, that's a lower version just for alternative views. Um, another thing, should you sit or stand? It's uh, in my Facebook groups that we have around virtual presentations the debate still goes on. Some people say if you're doing coaching work or one-on-one -on -one or you want to connect with the audience more then you should sit. Um, I think if you're making a presentation, a business one, then you should stand because that's what we do normally. So I just try to recreate what I do in person into a virtual space. So I like to stand, it gives me a different energy. But sitting down can also work or you switch between, between the two. So I have two webcams set, uh, set up so I can sit down switch webcam and suddenly it's quite smooth. But again, we don't need that for most people. So you just gotta decide, do you sit down, do you stand up, set your desk up accordingly, the rules around the eye level of cameras remains exactly the same. So you just have to adjust your screen to, to account for it. So I just wanna take a little bit of time just to go back some, to some basic principles of presentations rather than just virtual things the whole time. I always use, I use some of this model here, which we call using the system. And they're just basic things to think about that works for in-person or virtual. Again, in the main workshop, we go into these in more detail for this one, limited in time, just an overview. We think about the state. And by state, I mean your physiological state. So are you feeling stressed? Are you anxious? You need to find a way, if you are nervous, to calm yourself down. Is it breathing? Is it music beforehand? Is it focus? Is it practice? So your state needs to be calm and then you'll deliver calm. Being yourself is just saying we don't need to try and be someone else. So I want the personality to shine through. If you're making a presentation, I still want it to be you, but we can still get better structure to what that presentation is. Your stance can become quite, quite important, especially in person. You go into a management pre presentations, so you're presenting to a management team and you go in and your stance is sort of slumped or you're fidgeting and you're moving or you're clicking your pen the whole time. All these things are frustrating. If you're ever unsure, put your feet at 10 to two, hip width apart, even weight distribution, stand up straight. That's sometimes the easiest way to deal with stance. Tonality. We've sat through presentations and hopefully mine isn't the same where people are going, oh, this is, this is this draft here and this is this and this becomes quite boring and we don't want that. Bring some energy into your presentation. They're not normally that long. So therefore, how do we raise the game a little bit so we are sort of varying the tone and not in that monotonous tone that sends us to sleep. Now we talked about eye contact. <clears throat> so let's think about in-person eye contact brief briefly. In the chat box, can anybody share what they think 
is the appropriate amount of time to hold eye contact with someone. You, you can like give me a small range if you want to. What do you think an appropriate amount of time to hold eye contact with before they think you're strange? Any thoughts? Okay, so you three to four seconds, uh, five to 10 seconds. Now, five seconds, 15 seconds from Connie. Connie is an eye contact person, so. Let, let me try 15 seconds and we'll see if it comes strange, or even 10. So we'll start now. One and two and three and four and five and 10 seconds becomes quite a long time. I'd say one of uh, Suji's three to four seconds, I'd say one to three seconds is probably fine. Someone holds eye contact with you for five seconds, they need to be a good friend. Um, so good friends and family members and that. That's a bit easier. Team members, perhaps, sure. 15 seconds, you might start to scare this, this person, which you're not trying to do. Think about a boardroom. So we're presenting to a board ta table. We know we need to make eye contact with people. Everyone tells us that. Now, if I just go, if I look away from the camera and then look at it, imagining you're a person, one and two, and I move on to another person, that's probably enough. I've connected, we've locked eyes. Before it gets strange, I've moved on, but they feel I'm talking to them. So one to three seconds is actually fine to hold eye contact with. If you're unsure, test it on a family member later. Family members can go longer. So if it's strange with a family member, it's gonna be strange with a stranger. If you're, if you're in a room, try to make eye contact with each person, but don't go around the boardroom table. I've seen that before. They start at the front left, and then they go around, and then around, and then around, and they look a bit strange. So what do you wanna do? I like to vary. I start on my front left, then I might go back right, then I might go uh, front right, then I might pick someone back left. I'm trying to make sure I get around to everybody, <clears throat> but by mixing it up. So just the thing with eye contact, make it. Doesn't need to be as long as you think. Connect, eye contact in, move on to the next person. Everyone feels more comfortable. And the movement bit we've, we've discussed. Virtually with movement, you just got to be very careful with virtual background because your hands will do that ghosting thing, which we're not looking for. Now, I want to try, we talked about interaction and things. We're going to give you a chance to interact. We're going to do it short, maybe five minutes here. I'm conscious of time. I'm going to try to put you into a breakout room. Okay. Now, you may have experienced breakout rooms or you may not have done. Um, it's where I put you in and you'll be mixed up with some strangers from this group here. You'll get a prompt to say, join breakout room. And all I'd like you, you to do is come off your microphones, come off your cameras if you want to, and just share what you think some best practices are for virtual presentations. Okay, so this is point one. It doesn't have to be things I've covered. You might have, obviously there's lots more that I haven't covered in this time. So five minutes maximum into a breakout room, you can accept to join. If you're uncomfortable, you don't have to join. I just ask you hang on for, for five minutes and you just discuss some things that you think are good practices for virtual presentations or facilitation, okay? So I'm gonna try to trigger this breakout room that I realized I can't do. This is a great example of when, um, Okay, let me just see. Oops, I need to go backwards. So, can I be made host? Um, so, I just need to do a quick bit here. Okay. Eileen, can you make me a host? Is that possible? Okay, this is a great technical issue that is a great example. Let's use my own shortcoming as an example for virtual presentation skills. With Zoom and breakout rooms and WebEx as well, you need to be, be the host. At the moment, I have co-hosting rights. Okay, so co-hosting rights doesn't give you the right to trigger a breakout room. So this is something I should have 
mentioned at the start when you're all in the waiting room. If you haven't got hosting rights, you can't trigger the breakout room. It's a classic case of where you need to get the technology going right beforehand. So with that in mind, let's not waste any more time over this, but maybe we use the chat box here. So as we start to move towards the end, can some people put in the chat box what they think some good practices are for virtual presentations? I may have mentioned them already, or there might be other things. We talked about bad things beforehand. We're talking positive as we move towards the end, the end here. So best practices. Does anyone have any of their own tips, good things they've seen from other people, things they've mentioned that they think, yep, yeah, I need to look into that more? So any, <clears throat> yes, Josiah comes up with a good point. Close down ev everything, everything that can trigger a notification. So not just sound, but you know how sometimes if you're in WhatsApp, you might get a pop-up message. So I close down emails and WhatsApps and to-do lists and everything else that might cause it to go on. If you really want WhatsApp, you can have a second computer or your phone. Any other tips from people? Best practices for virtual presentations or facilitation? <clears throat> Nothing else from there. Oh, okay. And then using two laptops instead of one. Yes. Now, interlude of polls. Yeah, so Zoom does have poll functionality. You can set up beforehand. If you've, if you've put the meeting onto your account, you can set it up beforehand. Or you can trigger them during a meeting. It just takes time, of course, and you get distracted unless you've got um, a moderator who can help to set that up or you use Menti. So I've got a series of Menti ones planned beforehand. Dan then talks about two laptops. You might wonder like, why would you want to do that? Again, let's share what I do have here. Um, I've got an, I, an, an iMac. Uh, I just need to oh, get my camera going. So I have an iMac here that's set up so I can um, see what's coming up next. I have it, in, I have it as presenter view. So you can use it for a number of different things. So if you've got a separate screen or you've got another laptop that can help you with different views and options and things. Um, from Galaxy Now, put up the agenda or topics. Yes, and then flash it back up again, highlighting progress. I like that style. I don't use it, but I, 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 like, but I like that style. So that's, that's an excellent tip. A D, and give an introduction of functions, reactions. Yes, that's a good point from uh, Dian there. So what we often do for, I guess, the main workshops is we have like a one pager because a lot of people still don't know how to use Zoom and the functionality. For WebEx and Teams, it's even more difficult in some ways. So having a simple one page or two pages you can send out beforehand will increase, I guess, the participant's comfort in using the software. Rehearsals, yes, from, from CS. So that's a good thing to do. If you're not comfortable with the system, you can use rehearsals to try to get good. Okay, thank you very much for that. We've got a couple more slides to try to finish off. Now, virtual facilitation. I'm not gonna to talk too long about it in this workshop. Facilitation is a different skill and many people don't necessarily need to facilitate. But if you're in this industry or if you're a manager and you might want to facilitate a brainstorming session or a team planning session. Doing that virtually, a lot of people are avoiding it because they go, well, we might as well wait till we're back in the office. But to be honest, a lot of companies now are distributed. So we have many sort of, especially innovation teams where developers might be in India, the UI, UX in Singapore, product experts in Australia. So we need to think, well, how can we make it better? Now, if you're familiar with Zoom breakout rooms, you've got a digital whiteboard. So if you're in a breakout room, you can bring up with the share button, a digital whiteboard so you can take down notes. So that helps. I like to use third party soft software, which to be honest, some companies don't allow. So some banks especially don't allow it. But if I get, I guess, if I get my way, 
I use something called Miro or Miro, M-I-R-O. And this is like a collaborative digital whiteboard. There's also Mule, there's several of these. And what this allows you to do is everyone in a team, wherever they are, can contribute to the same whiteboard at the same time. And what this application specifically does is allows us to have sort of digital stick, sticky notes. We've got templates. So if you're ever familiar with UX or design thinking, you can have a journey map here and you can add to the journey map these little dots of, of, of votes. So you can vote, you can line up dots for people. This is just templates that I create for, for teams. So you want to vote, use user one has this color and they can apply their vote or I can name them as they come up. What else we got here? We've got post-it notes in different colors. Very easy just to create a post-it note and start writing on it. Um, we can do personas if you're familiar with personas and we just add our post-it notes in. I can set up blank templates and things. The message is virtual facilitation. You can do so much more with now than just having a Zoom call or a Skype call or a WhatsApp call. Even from this software, I can trigger my own digital call, my own video chat. So there's software out there and this has a free version. You can play around with it and then decide how to use it. So if I'm doing a design thinking workshop on an innovation one, I'm using this software. So teams can collaborate. They can add to it at the same time. And then I, as a facilitator, I can see what all the teams are doing on the same white, same whiteboard. So facilitation doesn't need to be sort of left to when we're back in the office. You can use software that's out there in, in the market, often with a free model, and it increases it. We can all chat, we can all talk, we can jump on, on video, and suddenly facilitation becomes possible. <clears throat> now the last thing just quickly is really virtual in person. Think about how you're constructing your presentation. These are presentation skills, sort of basics, but what we need to think about. How are you presenting it? Do you have a structure? Do you have a strong opening, a strong closing? There's something called the primary and recency effect where people remember more what you said at the start and what you said at the end than sometimes in the middle. Yet the middle is often where your most important information is. So you could do a great middle, a really poor end, and they think it was a bad presentation. So you've got to have a structure. You've got to think how you're going to open strongly, close strongly. People walk away with a positive impression, which is generally what we're looking for. If you ever want the most simple structure ever, this is a famous one. <clears throat> it's simplistic, but it works. You can tell the audience what you're going to say. That's maybe the agenda. Then you say it, and then you summarize by telling them what you just said. So today we're going to talk about virtual presentation and facilitation skills. Chat, 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 chat. So today we cover these main things to do with virtual and presentation skills. You've closed off the circle. So you've rounded off your presentation in a better way than just saying, oh, that's my last slide as your screen goes black or blank. We need to think about PowerPoint skills. Now there's so many different things here again don't really have time in today's session, but think about font size, think about contrast, think about can people see data? People love to put lots of data and graphs onto a slide that we then can't see. Virtually, people are looking at smaller screens. In person, you've got a big TV, you've got a projector screen. Virtually, they're looking on iPads, on laptops, on phones. So you need to think about the fact, are your fonts large enough? Are your graphs clear enough for people to see on small screens? It's a, again, a different mindset. Minimize the slides, go larger font, go fewer, uh, I guess, tables or graphs or data points. People need to see it. To go back to CS's point, rehearsal helps. Get a friend or a family member to log in and see if they can read the slides you're planning to present on that smaller screen. Um, let's go through that. Okay, so before I start to wrap up, are there any questions that people might have at this stage? You can either put it into the chat box or you can always unmute yourself at this stage.
So I'm open to any questions. We've got a couple of minutes. If anyone wants to ask any questions. Take a quick sip of water. Okay, June, an icebreaker. <clears throat> There's a lot of different icebreakers that you can do. I mean, as people came into the room, I just asked where people want to go on, on a holiday. That's quite a simple one. Um, but then, to be honest, if, we, if you're doing a workshop, try to do an icebreaker that connects with the workshop rather than just an icebreaker to have fun. I mean, fun's good and it gets people talking. But if you can connect a simple icebreaker in, let me give you an example. I do a lot of innovation workshops and design thinking. So a very simple icebreaker that I can do is called maybe it could be. So maybe it could be. And I might show, um, I could show something simple. I normally show like a router, a computer router. I could show you this, okay, sorry, this. And I could say, what could that be? And the idea is everyone has to come up with a different thing. So maybe it could be a wire hold, hold, holder, which it is. Maybe it could be um, a toy that makes noises. Yes, maybe it could be. So I normally use something like uh, a water sprinkler or a router, and it could be a hologram uh, projector. It could be a sensor. It could be a drone. It could be... So it's linking into innovations. It's making people think of alternative uses. So try to connect an icebreaker with the topic which you're presenting and you'll get people switching on a little bit, little bit quicker. Uh, Josiah, how do you gauge audience engagement effectively? Ah, that's a classic. Um, it's difficult. I'll just say that. It is difficult. The way that you can try to do it, of course, is to, uh, even if it was videos on your screen ability show, yes. You're right, I can ask for people's videos on and that is certainly a better step than not having it on. But you're right, you can't see a lot of the expressions because we've often got the view set up differently. Gallery view doesn't work when you're making a presentation for the whole time. Second laptop, you could have a gallery view on. It's difficult because we don't know whether people are switched off or switched on. So sometimes that's why you need to try to keep asking questions and engage them. If you're doing a workshop, smaller presentation is a bit easier. So if I'm presenting to 10 people, I have a list of the 10 people's names. And I make sure that rather than just saying put into the, into the chat box, I might go, uh, Alvin, what's your thoughts on this? And I make sure I try to get everybody to contribute at some point in time. I'm kind of holding them accountable. If you use WebEx, uh, WebEx has an attention button. It's like, a, like an exclamation mark. So it shows when people have been away from the application for a certain number of times. So then I like to ask those people. They're probably checking mails or doing, some, doing something else. Um, but that's how I'm trying to do it. The other way is you do a post-event survey and you see what people's understanding of the content was. It's not perfect, but if people understood the content, they might have been paying attention even though it seemed they weren't. Uh, Deanne said, how do you encourage your learners, participants to respond to your questions? Awkward when they're silenced. It is awkward. <laughs> There's no question. You know, I've asked some things today. Sometimes I got quite a few good responses. Other times it was, it was quiet. Um, I guess there's two things. At some point you need to know when to move on. So I'm going to hold it open for a while, but I'm not going to what we call flog a dead horse. I'm not going to just sit there and go, so questions and just wait till it's awkward for everyone. If you had this in person, we've got to think about the fact that people need time to process. So we've got a habit of interrupting people during thought process. If you think about a one-on-one -on -one or a coaching style, sometimes we ask a question, there's a silence and we jump in and answer it for them. Oh, how about this? Or do you mean this? And we stop that person in their thought process. So I guess one thing to think about is, have you given people enough time? I realized the first time I used Menti, I thought people weren't using it and therefore I stopped the exercise too quickly. I had a friend on and they said, that was the first time I've used Menti. It took me a while just to find it and put the code in and all of these things. So people need a little bit more time to 
recognize instructions or to take part in things. So that's one, that's one thing. The other thing, if it's a small group, you can call people out. I do that, it's a bit awkward, but they're signed up for it. It's either work or they're joining a workshop. For larger groups, it's a bit more difficult. I can't get all 43 participants at this moment to answer things, but we can get six or seven. And to be honest, it's been the same six or seven who have been contributing in most cases. Now that could be you're more extroverted, that could be you're more tuned in, but I also know sometimes I sit through webinars quiet, but I'm fully engaged and I'm learning. So you can't beat yourself up if people are quiet, but you can try different approaches and try to get people to respond, or if people are quiet, can they use something like Menti or another tool where they can contribute without having to speak up? And therefore we're not trying to make an introverted person feel uncomfortable. Um, quick thing from Galaxy you now, always find right interval periods to ask questions or requests for participation. Yes, yeah, survey or recap with multiple choice questions. Yes, things like that. So you can always bring in these surveys, intervals and questions and thumbs up and things. It's, I don't like, it's not my style to go, everyone give a thumbs up and we'll take a photo. That's not my style, I'm more on the business side. But I still want that engagement in. Um, Eileen, other than Menti, is there any other that is good to use during presentations? There's a number of different ones. Even there's, um, I can't remember the name of it because I've got it saved as a, as a shortcut. It's a spinning wheel. And I put the names, if it's a small group, it's a free, free thing, like the spinning wheel of fortune thing. I write the people's names in each of the segments on the wheel and it spins the wheel and it randomly stops in someone's name and they have to answer a, a question. So that's quite a fun way of uh, doing things. Um, Dan Lin, <clears throat> yes, he might jump off, get distracted at home. What do you think about playing video? Playing video, be careful with and rehearse it. All these applications like Zoom and WebEx and Teams are not great with video and not great with video sound. So really do test it beforehand. When you're with Zoom, you've got to make sure you're sharing the computer sound. It's not always a default option. So I've shown videos where there was no sound for participants because I hadn't ticked the right box. So whatever system you're using, whether it's Teams or WebEx or BlueJeans or Zoom, learn how the video works for those applications and test it with people in the background. Um, music in the background during intervals. Yes, nothing wrong. Um, for my longer workshops, I embed a playlist into a slide. So I can have a holding slide up. I've got a playlist embedded into that slide and you can play some music during the tea break or the intervals that still feels like they're part of the experience rather than just, because I, I might drop off camera, you know, bathroom break or tea or something, but have a holding slide. So the holding slide goes up, you can play some music check the volume as well. Sometimes people pay volume through their computer. They put it up loud, but it comes through louder on your systems quite often and can be very distracting. So play it lower than you think, but enough just to hear. Now, at the start of this, we talked about time. So I'm conscious of time, of timing. So I'm just gonna wrap up my presentation now, and then I'll stay on for a couple of minutes if people do have questions. So I guess the last thing to do is just to have one slide about the upcoming uh, workshop, which we do have. In this workshop, it's a half day workshop. We go through similar things that we've discussed today in a lot more detail, I'll share more tips and secrets and applications. We'll test things out, we'll have people present. It's an interactive one. We bring in alternative sort of, I guess, ways of engaging, pe engaging people. So all those questions you might have, to be honest, we cover most of it during this. We go deeper into the facilitation side as well, because that's really a skill that took me a while. And I do leadership retreats in person. That's a big part of my work. But then how do I do that virtually? It's difficult, but we use the software that's available. That's the easiest way. And then the basics of structuring a presentation, strong openings, they are still valid, okay? So if this is of interest, 
please do sign up. We've got Carmen's details there or whatever contact you have as Adventists will be able to help you out with this. It will be me delivering it. We'll have a similar setup here. There'll be lights and microphones and things. Um, and we hope to see you there. So thank you very much for the uh, attendance today from the questions of people who came through. If you didn't ask a question, hopefully you're still listening and making some notes and hopefully you took away something from it. And we'll hope to see you later on in June. So for those of you who are still on, if you, I've finished all of my content, so feel free to drop off. Thank you very much for attending. If you did want to stay on and have any questions, I'm going to stay on for about two minutes here, two or three minutes, just to see if anyone does have questions. If not, have a good week ahead and hope to see you soon. Thank you, Connie. I'll pass it on to my, to, to, to my parents who are responsible for those.